be back after coffee and break. Uh, I'm going to sort of stand in room only. There is room in the front. If you come in and want to walk uh, all the way down the front, don't worry, I won't mind. I don't bite. I think I did take a shower this morning. Uh, so come on down, and we can uh, spend a little bit of time talking about one of my favorite language, my favorite things, of course, which is Python, and how to make use of it. I am coming from a new startup called Quantsite. Most of you know me, many of you know me, well, many of you don't know me at all. But if you do know me, uh, it's kind of from my experience with NumPy, SciPy, uh, Anaconda, which is a very popular Python distribution and Python uh, machine learning platform, data science platform, that I helped found that company. Just recently spun out a new company called Quantsite, whose purpose is to really help companies use AI and ML effectively, and then also to help open source become sustainable. But we're talking today about practical machine learning. I won't talk in detail about some of the key technologies and key techniques, but mostly talk about kind of how to use it and what are the key steps in using Python effectively for machine learning and data, which is at the heart of this machine learning problems. I want to start with kind of how I got into this stuff, which is back at the Mayo Clinic when I was doing my PhD. Like many people, I procrastinated in my graduate program to work on open source software. That's a theme that has emerged, and I actually heard it here with the previous uh, gentleman who spoke. He also, as a graduate student, was postponing his work, his uh, education to write open source software. And this turned out to be a very valuable thing for me to do. At the time, I had no idea. I was just, I had three kids at home. My wife was expecting me to finish my degree. And I was basically writing software. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But I was inspired at the time by a man named Richard Robb at the Mayo Clinic. He was trying to bring Star Trek medicine to the world and doing it with advanced, they had lots of 3D images, they had lots of 4D images. I'm trying to figure out how to make that easier to use. So I was doing science there. I was trying to solve this uh, n-dimensional wave equation, basically, and try to invert these wave fields we can measure with MRI and ultrasound and get elastography or get stiffness out of it. That led me to Python. I was using MATLAB and C and Fortran at the time, but I, I didn't. When I was programming C, I had to think a lot about pointers and memory management and classes, but I wanted to be thinking about science. I wanted to think about the problem, domain, the area that I needed to learn about, and I needed to kind of shift out those pointers and codes and classes. And Python, I found, was a way I could do that, so that led me to Python. I started using Python way back in 1997, version 1.4. How many Python 1 users do we have in the audience today? Maybe a few people. Piaro, I know you're here, a Python 1 user. Python 1.4 was the very first version I started to use. I was so excited when Python 1.5.2 came out because it offered a lot of neat uh, improvements to language. Uh, this is a picture of Guido, if you don't know. He's actually from uh, Europe. He's uh, uh, the creator of Python. The very first problem I started to focus on was actually a data problem. And this is true still today. It's still about the data. Trying to actually do machine learning, trying to actually do anything with data, you have to figure out how to get it and get it into the computational power you have. And today it's even harder. Back then we had you know, Unix file systems, and the others people using Windows, but not those guys were. Uh, but now you've got different operating systems, you've got different databases, you've got uh, online databases, the data is everywhere. And often how you get access to that data is the biggest problem. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for me, I, I show this slide because I got inspired by a guy named Michael Miller who wrote his package and gave it out to the world. And then I basically looked at that, learned how to write Python extensions by looking at his code, and then I made my very first one in 1998, and that kind of set me on a journey that took me over a waterfall that kind of made me leave academia and all the rest. Now I'm here in Estonia talking about NumPy and SciPy 20 years later. Uh, also inspired by Guido. SciPy, how many people who you know what SciPy is? Raise your hand if you know what SciPy is. Oh, awesome, a lot of people. Very surprising to me. SciPy was a little, it's effectively the very first Python distribution, masking as a library. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons learned and things we didn't do great back at the time. But I started working on SciPy effectively in 1998, almost 20 years ago. And I did it by wrap, just wrapping code. I saw, hey, there's some special functions that are in this old C library. Let me make them accessible to Python. It's called CPs. Then it was a, I borrowed some code from a professor of statistics and put it in called stats. There's some FFT fast wrappers that we made for FFTW. In 1999, basically I, this, this, this year is the year I procrastinated my PhD and I had to kind of, well, I showed this to my wife later after we had a job and she realized I wasn't just, um, we made very little money at the time, but I was sitting there, I was just, just hacking away instead of pursuing other things because I really love bringing old code Fortran libraries, C libraries, things that I loved thinking about um, from linear algebra, learning differential equations, optimization, helping bring that to the world. And actually, so uh, at this time, basically this year, <laughs> there was a, a very smart person called Pierre Peterson. I think he's in the audience. Pierre, raise your hand, stand up, actually. Stand up, stand up for a second. Everyone needs to know Pierre, raise my hand. 
Thank you very much. Sci-Fi would not be here without uh, the work of Piaru, actually. So he wants me doing this. And kind of as a real computer scientist, Wood said, what are you doing all this manually for? This is crazy. You're going to manually hand wrap every single Fortran code in existence? And of course, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll just do that. Why not? Uh, I have nothing better to do except feed my family. Um, <laughs> but I had a lot of fun doing it. And so then he wrote something called F2Pi. Anybody use F2Pi? Raise your hand if you know what F2Pi is. You should, if you don't. Well, most of you probably don't use Fortran anymore. But what F2Pi did, it took any Fortran code and automatically created Python extensions to it, Python bindings to it. So he automated the process of building sci-fi, basically. And it's a fascinating story, fascinating tool. And that was in 1999. I ended up using these tools to complete my PhD. I did, end, I did finish my PhD, eventually, 2001. Used plotting packers called Dislin, uh, actually written by a, a European as well, um, and a lot of C extensions. And then in, you know, sci-fi really emerged in 2001 as a combination of a bunch of things I've been writing, worked with Piaru on some better interfaces to linear algebra, uh, interpolation and F2Pi. So Estonia had a big deal to do with sci-fi's emergence. I kind of want to make that clear and you know, congratulate you. Uh, it's all, from my, my mind, Estonia has always been a tech center because of that. Uh, but it really, Piaru's involvement in sci-fi really motivated me to continue to work in open source. Uh, back before Facebook, back before Instagram, back before all these ways we keep in touch with each other. Back then, we would just hack on code, make, put it up on web pages, and then other people would use it and give us pull requests. Not pull requests, they'd send us emails with patch files. Right, that was the pull, pull request of yesteryear, and it was a lot of fun. I found it very intoxicating to be able to inter in interact with and engage with people all over the world that I only knew over email. Uh, I, I met Piero the first time in 2008, finally, you know, seven years later, and it's been 10 years since I've, met, since I've seen him again. So uh, fantastic. I want to definitely thank uh, Piero on all the work he did to make sci-fi actually happen. And it's been, it's been more popular, more used than I even expected. And a lot of it has to do with the machine learning um, sort of explosion, because it's gone from this tight-knit group of, of uh, engineers and scientists and mathematicians who love to do array processing and know what that meant, and then all of a sudden everybody's doing array processing because now it's tensors and it's TensorFlow and, it, and everything in machine learning is a tensor. So it's like this whole community, all of a sudden we look out the back door and there's this humongous group of people all interested in the work that we've been kind of been in our spare, our spare cycles on for 20 years. It's, it's daunting, interesting, and also um, knows uh, a lot of fun to interact and find new people and have how they're thinking about the problem. So sci-fi is actually where I started, it was my love, but then uh, at the time, there were actually multiple bifurcations happening in the, in the ecosystem. In 2000, 2001 time frame, there was a new library called Numeray that was coming into existence. Numeric was a library that Jim Hugan wrote and others that I was using to build sci-fi and that we were building around. Then Numeray came around and what I saw is this fragmentation. It's the same fragmentation that exists today, actually, between, uh, if you look at TensorFlow and CMTK and MXNet and PyTorch, like all these different frameworks are doing kind of the same thing. And that same fragmentation happened in Python back in 2000. And that's really what inspired me to write NumPy, to basically spend time, see if I could bring them together and create something that everybody could build on top of and have a unified uh, platform that we could then see a growth explosion uh, grow around. So that was in 2005. I sacrificed my, um, my tenure position at the university to basically spend time writing NumPy. Uh, the, the tenure committee that reviewed my application didn't know how exciting NumPy would be. They weren't quite convinced that was exactly what I should have spent my time on. So they asked me to come back two years later and try to apply. I didn't, I didn't get tenure the first time. So instead I left and went to business and went to see if I could uh, apply these capabilities and technologies in the business world. So NumPy came out in 2005, and it was very much a, a group of, a small group of us initially. Um, this is true of any kind of meaningful open source, it's usually done by a small group, but then to be successful it has to attract a larger community of contributors. It has to increase the number of people who are contributing. Now fortunately NumPy and SciPy have both done that, and they're very large groups of people making these successful, in fact are responsible for the success, the current success of NumPy and SciPy. Very, uh, it's one thing that I love. I love figuring out how to help people go build communities, take code, take ideas they have, bring people together, cross boundaries, reduce silos, reduce data, kind of data silos. So kind of right now, one of my missions is how do I figure out how to take some of these same capabilities that brought the Python world together under Array Object, see if we can figure out how to bring machine learning libraries together under common ways to talk about data. So I'm excited about the Onyx uh, capability. I'm excited by a project that I'm calling Plurius, XND, look all this up online, we won't talk about it today, but I'm, I have a lot to motivate me still. A lot of us are still very excited about, and kind of hopefully 20 years from now I'll be able to talk about those things. 
So Numpy did kind of succeed in unifying the Python ecosystem, and it brought a lot of people together, and now a whole explosive set of tools emerged around it. Uh, very excited by that. So I want to get, so that, that brings us to kind of the history of why did I get involved with this in the first place, and how, and all of a sudden we're in the middle of AI and ML. When I think of AI, I, don't, I think of augmented intelligence. For me, a human will always, maybe not always, but certainly for the next 50 years, you're gonna have, it's more about empowering people rather than replacing people. Now, it might replace something you're doing today, but you, then you shift and do something more important and let the machine do some of the things that are more mundane and boring. Uh, so it's augmented intelligence, the way I think about it. There's a lot of future possibilities. I'll go briefly through these um, just to kind of inspire you. Some people are thinking, well, what do I use AI for? A lot of things. Anytime you have a, really, anytime you have a complex uh, function of many variables that you want to have an input and have an output that's kind of understandable, you can apply AI to that. But it's, uh, it, it, it requires domain expertise. Like, I strongly believe that you have to associate with people that know what they're doing in this space. You can't, as just a, hey, I'm an AI, AI researcher, I know how to play with scikit-learn and TensorFlow, alone you're going to struggle. You need to kind of partner and pair with people that know the business, the area that, they're, that you're trying to help. And that's really how to make it work. We saw that in the previous talk. So these, this, this solution I saw, basically this idea from car manufacturers, they're putting in your uh, cars these sensors that basically phone home over the 4G network, now 5G network, and they're basically just sending information about your car so they can predict if you're going to break down, which is really exciting, potentially the idea of, hey, it's going to call you and say, you know what, your car is really struggling because it's the, the carbon, carbon dioxide mixture and the oxygen mixture, something's going wrong with fuel, your fuel line. That's a possibility. Now, I came from the healthcare industry, from medicine, so I'm very fascinated with how medicine can be improved by a... Uh, AI. This is area in particular is one where actually government intervention is necessary because we have to break down the old regulations that were written in for <coughs> yesteryear, 100 years ago. They were probably useful. Today they're in the way. Actually, of helping medicine make improvements. Um, a lot of things. This is true. In when I was at the Mayo Clinic, I could see one reason I got out of medicine is because I could see it was actually bureaucracies and the regulations that were in the way of progress. And so I, I went over the technology. It doesn't have to be the case. You have to kind of think. Think, um, think about how you actually help people. So there's a lot happening right now. For example, we are actually starting to see certain diagnostics. Uh, for example, this was a dermatology scan. You take a picture and then with the same accuracy of trained professionals, tell whether somebody has skin cancer or not. This is a recent paper published. Uh, you can show how the age of, take, take radiology, take a, an x-ray and show the age of a person with a very low um, deviation. Now this is a relatively easy task. I think one thing, I'll, the, the caveat is that these are easy tasks. So just because they can be done doesn't mean they can, that, that we're at the uh, precipice of the singularity we shall be worried about the machines taking over. Um, that's a philosophical question. It may happen someday. I am potentially my grandchildren need to worry about that. But that is not something we need to worry about today. We need to think hard about how do we use this to make our lives better today. Uh, geophysics is another area. Lots of one of the things that the oil industry has a problem with is all the geophysicists are retiring, and there aren't new people getting trained. And so it's kind of very hard for people who used to look at seismic data and interpret where the fissures were and where they look for new oil. How are they doing this? And there's this really interesting paper in, 1990, in 2016 uh, that they they're showing that actually just looking at the seismic interface, they can kind of infer and, and apply the knowledge of previous uh, uh, experts to figure out that automatically. So there's a lot of, in multiple areas, there's exciting things happening. And here, you're gonna find new things. There, there's a, just a number of things. That's why it's so exciting, but there's, everybody's involved. We heard today from Microsoft, they have some impressive, um, you know, CNTK and lots of services. Actually, every one of these big vendors, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, they all have kind of, they call them something different, cognitive services, perception APIs, Watson, AI services, that effectively have these magic, pre-trained AIs in the cloud that are starting to be at the verge of usability. <laughs> uh, basically, you can start to use them for real practical use cases. And you really can. It does take some elbow grease to put them together and actually bring something to practice to, to the world. That's why they're all so excited to get you on board and get you helping them apply those capabilities for hopefully on their hardware or their clouds. <laughs> but uh, uh, Google has something called Perception APIs. You go look and actually see they got natural language, speech, translation, vision, video intelligence. They all kind of factor a little differently. Microsoft factors it, vision, speech, language, knowledge, search. We saw other things they've provided as well. IBM calls it Watson. They have conversation, knowledge, vision, speech, language, empathy, APIs. They're really simple, straightforward to use. If you can use curl, or if you can use Python and the, um, uh, the request API in Python, you can actually
access these capabilities and send them data and get interesting things back. It's actually really powerful. Uh, Amazon has Lex, Poly, some crazy spelling of recognition. Uh, Apple's a little different. Apple's actually been focusing on how to take machine learning models and apply them on their, on their phone. The edge computing problem. How do I get these models out from your desktop to your devices? Really interesting. They've come up with a Core ML concept. I'm actually curious about Core ML and Onyx to see if there's some. Uh, but all of them are using Python, which is really exciting. So there's an amazing promise and also a challenge with AI and machine learning. We have a long way to go. There's still a lot of obstacles. So I was really excited uh, by Siam's talk on, on Onyx. I'm, I'm going to follow up on that. We're going to talk about some things we're doing. Maybe we can help. Uh, these silos of technology advancement are, are real. Whether it's you know someone sharing for, hey, be a Python user, oh, no, be a Scala user, be an R user, be a C Sharp user, be a C++ user. There's kind of mind share around these concepts. In some sense, it's like, why does it matter so much? Can't we just figure out frameworks that everybody can use and then leverage the particular thing that makes useful, that makes sense for you today? That's still a dream, and there are people working on it, and I'm excited by the, by the innovations that are happening there, but it still works. Still, still something's got to be done to help with this. There's lots of silos of data. People have data in SQL libraries, they put it on the cloud, they make, it, they make a big deal about data lakes. Only those data silos become, uh, uh, then they become your data lock-in. They become where you put your data, it depends on now what you have to do. And there's, there's solutions to that, but they're not as popular as others. Uh, there's silos of cloud computing that's emerging. This is just emerging. And we'll see how kind of this plays out as all of the uh, Microsoft's invested billions in their cloud. They've got amazing tools. Google's also investing in their cloud. Amazon's investing in their cloud. Everybody's investing in their cloud wanting you to use their hardware. Uh, and then their software is lagging when hardware advances. Hardware is advancing so rapidly. What's at the Intel Developer Conference? And they've got um, AI chips coming out. They purchased Neon. They've got Nirvana. Uh, NVIDIA is pushing the envelope as the hardware. These hardware is amazing. FPGAs are coming out. People are able to program. But you, as average software developer from Python or C or JavaScript or Java, kind of aren't really using all that capability. You have to get, you know, lower level, and then even there, the lower level interfaces aren't that great. They're slow. Or they're not really taking advantage of the hardware. There's a lot of that, that bridge is still there and it's still important. Uh, there's a lot of organizational problems, organizational infrastructure. Companies are like I talked about the regulation in, in government. Uh, this is the thing. It's reason why a place like Estonia excites me. Because here at Estonia, you can make some of those decisions. Now, you have some constraints because you're part of the EU. I understand that. But in a country, you can actually make some important changes, some revolutionary changes to the way things are done that can have an impact for people. And so that's, that's an exciting thing, actually. Because uh, organizational infrastructure challenges absolutely create barriers of growth and prosperity. Um, and central to this is technology is changing faster than education can keep up. Everywhere I go, I see the promise of AI and ML, but I see the gap in where people understand their understanding and what's possible. And there's so much need for that education to happen. And it, it's not, there's really good things happening out there, but ultimately education, uh, it's like one of the things I learned from medicine when I was in the Mayo Clinic and learned about American style medical training is, I would never go to a doctor who said, yeah, I went to medical school. That, the, I didn't really care who went to medical school, because great, you're trained to be a surgeon, but I'm not gonna let you touch me. Who did you train with in your apprenticeship afterwards? Like real medicine is learned after you go to medical school and you have your internship and your fellowship and your residency training. That's where the knowledge was passed on. I think the same is true in data science and ML. There's a lot of programs out there you can go take on more course, but until somebody's shown they really connect with a domain problem or really understand how to apply this in practice, I, a little I get a little nervous about whether they can really do <coughs> it in action. Uh, and then the out-of-date re regulatory infrastructures are everywhere. So I use this picture because it kind of, to me, we see that there's a car. AI exists, just like the Ford Model T existed in 1905, right? But the dream is something bigger, something broader, something more futuristic. And it took, you know, well, we're not even there yet, so it's like 200 years from the Model T to where we are. Maybe we can get there in 50 years. There's still so much to do to go from the promise of AI to the possibility of machine learning AI. It's still ahead of us. So there's much more to come. Right now, I think one of the key things is, you, is we need the last mile integrators. We need a lot of people who can take the tools, take the knowledge, and do the connectivity to people. This is where Anaconda comes in. It's one of, it's one of the reasons I was so excited about Anaconda. Anaconda was about bringing the tools together and giving people the ability to quickly build solutions and translate those solutions from your desktop to the data center to deployment to the mobile phone to the mobile. To the mobile. And so, and kind of connecting to all kinds of data. Uh, that was the real, the real value, and that's really the, the, the power. So Anaconda, I say, you know, makes machine learning magic accessible to mere mortals. It's uh, all this explosion in software comes at a price, which is your human uh, short-term memory and ability to process. Like we have a limited ability to process.
concepts and what leads to brands, what leads to kind of this, this coalition, this, this, these uh, coalition around particular ideas. So, you know, of course, everybody loves the modeling, predicting, classifying, visualizing. These are sort of the easy things to do, and, and everybody can, there's lots of ways to do that. And it kind of makes that easy, too. But even the harder things, feature labeling, data cleansing, data extraction, deploying, reproducing, scaling, these are really essential, but not as fun. You also have to have help doing that, too. And that's, that's really where Anaconda helps. So I want to talk a little bit about Python Anaconda here, just for a few minutes, to kind of give a little bit of background of these. I said I left academia. Uh, because uh, I realized that my passion was in helping bring people together and create market or uh, market sustainable techniques for helping these grow. And I did some work at a consulting company for, for several years in, in the United States, learned some things, and realized in 2012 that I really wanted to start a new company, Anaconda, to kind of grow the ecosystem, grow around these tools, and then also really double down on the community and build a separate organization called NumFocus, whose whole purpose was to be community governed and to have community support. And uh, since so we did in 2012, kind of pushed both of these efforts forward. And they've both been progressing, actually, for six years and making their progress. Uh, recently, and it's because of the health of everybody else, I mean, I'd like to say that NumPy and SciPy is why PyTown is very popular. But I know the truth is that the reason PyTown is very popular is because of Pandas, Scikit-Learn, and Jupyter. Now, those guys are my friends, and they also use NumPy and SciPy. They're the early users of these tools, so I can feel like I helped a little bit. But ultimately, you know, it's the people around you that make the biggest difference. So I, I learned that I really like to enable people with tools to help them become successful. But it's been amazing to watch this huge growth. I like, there's a correlation growth between this and Anaconda as well, and I sometimes think, you know, correlation, not causation, but we don't, we can shove that under the rug sometimes. It's Anaconda that's helped this happen. I think it's simply been, we've been at the same part of the history and time at the same moment. But it's been amazing how much interest there is getting the data, making the data accessible, I think, is one of the keys. Data is accessible, people can use it, don't have to spend all day doing it. So the Python stack, and this comes from Jake Vonderplas, who has shown this uh, uh, very, very well in the past. Python at the start, but really Python by itself is not enough. This is why some of the efforts like, like Iron Python and Jython and PyPy, you know, it's not just Python is the challenge. It's Python plus several stacks. So if you're going to kind of create a new runtime for Python, you have to create a runtime that enables all this other stuff to come as well. If you just have Python by itself, you'll get only some part of the story. This is layer on top, NumPy was critical, Cython. We've added to that over the past six years, Numba, and I'll talk a little about Numba later, and then Dask, which is a parallelization capability. And then Jupyter, uh, coming from MyPython. Then on top of that, you have Matplotlib, and Bokeh, okay, visualization tools, Pandas as a data frame library, the Sci-Fi ecosystem of, of tools, X-Array, which is a larger a labeled and NumPy arrays, basically. Then on top of that, you have Scikit-Learn, you have NetworkX, SAS models, PyMC3, and this, the list goes on, this is just a sampling. And then you have the user stories, the AstroPy, the BioPython, the SunPy, many, many more ecosystem frameworks for doing your problem on top of this other stack. Now, most interesting people here, of course, are the plethora of machine learning tools on top of this, the TensorFlow, the Torus, the CNTK, MXNet, and so forth. So that's one look at the Python stack. If you broaden that stack beyond Python to R and, and Java and Hadoop and machine learning, all the rest of the tools, then you have this, this pastiche of existing tools. It's difficult to kind of get your head around. And Anaconda really brings all those together. Anaconda is like a single uh, kind of installable package management system to bring it all together and make it easy for you to deploy on top of that. One of the things I like to talk about is this concept called the OODA, OODA loop, the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act loop. It's, it's a concept that came out of the US military years ago about how do you train people to respond quickly to data and, and do something about it. And they, they codified it in this, these, these four areas. Observe and orient to decide. That's effectively what you have to do in the data science world. So I have a version of this slide here that I talk about the data science workflow. Now, I go from data, getting data, to understanding data. Now, that's a simple slide, and there's a whole lot in that red arrow, exploratory data analysis and this, going from getting data, understanding the data, to understand your world. There's a lot of work that happens. There's a feedback loop. But the goal is to take that and produce data products. These are things like microservices, reports, dashboards, visualizations, applications, and from there, of course, decision actions. I, uh, maybe we'll start having AI in that decision actions, although I think it, there'll be human-guided augmented intelligence for the, for the foreseeable future before we sort of let that run open loop, so to speak, with a, just a machine. But Anaconda really helps around the getting data, understanding data, and producing data products. So that's, that's sort of, I have to help kind of finalize how you think about Anaconda. Anaconda sits on all the data, 
So it is not a database. It uses data from multiple databases. It also, you hear people talk, talk a lot about data lakes. I'm not a big fan of the concept of data lake. I think I'm a big fan, to me, the internet is a data lake. You have a URL to your data, you have a data lake. Right? The big problem is you, you do have um, uh, a cache question, an optimization question. You need to bring the data together for some cases. That's fine. That's an optimization step. We don't talk about the L2 cache and call that memory. Right? We don't we talk about the memory. And data is everywhere. What's the problem with data is bringing it together in what I call a virtual data lake. Metadata, helping people understand the information they're getting. And knowing, are we using this, you know, to put it in computer programming terms, people out there in an the organization will write, somebody will write a time class, and they'll write the class here this way with certain attributes they work, work on. Another group will write it a different way with different attributes they use. Now you want to bring that together. It's not about bringing those class objects together in the same file system. It's about mentally people understanding data in common ways. This is a foundational, foundational problem that actually you're, you're wrestling against. It's a human problem more than it's a technology problem. And so um, Anaconda helps, but it helps by raising the level of conversation so people can use a common language Python. They can use things like notebooks to share their information and really kind of iterate more quickly to come to a knowledge about what they're working on more simply. And Anaconda as a company, we do a lot of open source stuff. I'm very big in the community and growing open source ecosystems. But of course, to survive as a product company, you have to sell something. And what is sold in Anaconda is something called Anaconda Enterprise. I'm not going to go into detail about that. You can certainly look it up. They're happy to, uh, Anaconda is very, very excited to help you use Anaconda Enterprise to effectively make use of Anaconda inside your organization. Uh, there's you know, 6 million users, thousands of packages, hundreds of, hundreds of enterprise customers, uh, definitely eager to, for, for your use. A great use case of Anaconda Enterprise and Anaconda is to take advantage of the machine learning libraries that are available, deploy them to your organization easily. So from Scikit-Learn, which is the first one, H2O, TensorFlow, CNTK, there's Keras, MXNet, HDBoost, Cafe2, uh, PyTorch, and Chainer. I'm actually a big fan of Chainer. Who's heard of Chainer in the audience? Okay, a couple, one person. Yeah, and the rest of you, look it up. You really, really should get to know Chainer. Like, uh, Torch and CNTK and uh, TensorFlow have huge companies supporting them. So you hear about them very easily. But Chainer is actually a very interesting technology. Torch borrowed from Chainer because it was the first to really bring its... its I, I think Chainer more of as a community-built uh, machine learning stack. And as I look at it, it's like, oh yeah, that's how I would have done it if I were to start and build a machine learning framework on top of NumPy and the ecosystem. Now there's things to do still with Chainer, but I like it. I like it. It's, you know, so Chainer and Torch are currently my recommended. I think you know, take a look at the rest. They're certainly worth, uh, valuable and worthwhile. And I really like the idea of enabling um, ability for people to use which, whatever one is useful for them at the moment and then share deployment through something like Onyx. I'm really excited about that. But take a look. I, I highly recommend taking a look at these tools. Chainer is built with a, by a, essentially a consulting company uh, in Japan. They use it. Uh, Toyota uses it for their self-driving cars. It's used in robotics competitions. It's got a lot of use and a lot of great. And people, it's very fast. And it uses the thing I love about it is it uses NumPy for the tensor. It doesn't invent a new one, right? I look at all the other frameworks and they invent a new tensor. Even though we spent all this time building NumPy, they invent a new one. <laughs> And, and, th and there is a buffer protocol in Python, so we fixed it twice, so at least potentially there's ability for cooperation on that front. But I think there's an opportunity to kind of consolidate around common uh, type concepts, and that's what I'm hoping to do over the coming couple of years, uh, hopefully. Of course, all this complexity and capability has a fundamental problem, and that's distribution. If you look at the, just NumPy and the number of packages that depend on NumPy, it's this huge constellation. Very exciting until you come and want to use this stuff. Now what? I gotta install it somehow. Now what? So how do I do this? That's kind of why Anaconda, you know, as we were searching around for how to help in the world, that's why we merged towards a cross-language, cross-platform package manager called Conda. That's why we did it, is to solve a very fundamental problem of getting these tools, making them available. Pandas depends on NumPy. Cafe depends on Pandas and NumPy. That's just one example. So how do I get this? So Conda, if you haven't heard of Conda, how many Conda users have got in the audience? Raise your hand. Get a little exercise. Okay, so there's a few of you who are going to be pleasantly surprised when you go learn about Conda and realize a, a solution for many things you think you have a problem with, you don't have a problem with it. Just use Conda. You just don't know about the solution. Uh, Conda is what helps you cross-platform, uh, Linux, Mac, Windows, cross-language, Python, R, Julia, C, C++, Fortran. It helps you manage the packages in the same way on all of your devices. Uh, there's even kind of a, a, a Raspberry Pi Conda. Uh, very common kind of concept. Uh, so it's cross-platform language agnostic. Conda Forge is this community-driven uh, package maintainers. There's 500, 600 maintainers of packages 
uh, 4,000 packages they're maintaining. And then besides just managing, managing packages, they also have what some of the other distributions don't have or some of the other package management solutions don't have, which is tied to environments. This is the notion that, hey, I don't just want pandas installed once on my system. I want it installed 15 times, depending on what workflow I'm using. So I don't want one system version. I want all of the versions that I need for a particular uh, management, for a particular workflow. So an environment, and, it, and I don't also, I can use Docker for that, but I don't need a container. I just want to have, you know, a thousand environments on my one container, right? So it gives you the flexibility to build environments that are specific to your use case. And then there's a concept called Anaconda Project as well. So I'll move quickly past this. It's very easy to use. It lets you have language-independent stacks of software on your systems. Um, you can install, can list, can search, can create for a new environments. So you can manage Python 3, Python 2, even your Python 1 environment. I can go back and play with Python 1 when I get nostalgic and when I reminisce of the days when Piaro and I were hacking around in uh in 20 years ago. Uh, and I can remove packages. There's advanced kind of uses. You can kind of update, you can kind of install a certain revision, you can pin to a certain list of packages. It's, a cro again, Pythonic cross-platform, cross-language package management. It eases development, eases the ability to go. You can basically write once in that deployment, the thing you create, and easily be deployed across your data center, your desktop to your data center. It's a, a, sim it's a very, very straightforward, simple solution. All right, now I'm going to talk, I am going to talk for the next uh, 15 minutes about one of the problems that I really, really was passionate about and have, I'm still passionate about, which is scaling the PyData stack. When I first started Anaconda, one of the, I love NumPy, I love SciPy, but realized they were very geared towards one machine. And that's not just, that's just not going to do it when I've got thousands of machines I want to take advantage of. So how do I apply these capabilities to a broader scale? Now scaling really has two meanings in this context. One is I'm going to scale up. Which I, which I use to say I'm going to make the hardware better. I want to make sure that my NumPy stack can use the GPU. I want to make sure that my PyData stack can use FPGAs. I'm going to try scaling out. I want to make sure that my NumPy stack, my PyData stack, can use 3,000 machines, 3,000 different cores. How do, so those, those are two problems. And it turned out we solved them with two different solutions. Numba is the scale-up solution. It's how we go from Python to any kind of machine. Dask is how we scale out. And those are two very popular projects. Um, there's a third project that started out called Dask ML, which is basically combining kind of doing machine learning on top of Dask as a center core. If I look at something like, you know, to me, the ideal machine learning platform has the ideas of Torch and Chainer with Dask being used for scaling and Numba being integrated for scaling up. That's where all of them can improve. Like, not, neither Chainer nor PyTorch is using Dask or using Numba as it should. Uh, they're completely available for use. There's just, I think, lack of familiarity. Like I said, these tools are changing quickly. It's education that's a problem. So there's lots of opportunities to bring these together. But it's not simple. I guess that's a, I should caveat. Like, you have to be serious. You have to want to dig in and really understand how this works. It's not, you, know, you do have to, you know, a new contributor is going to take a few weeks, a few months to really get to where you're going to be able to contribute uh, productively. But if you do, it'll pay off. So scaling up, the num number. So number. <laughs> It, it was my dream when I started Anaconda to kind of do this. And it really started with NumPy. When I wrote NumPy, one of my favorite parts of NumPy, if you recall in 98, I wrote that CPS module that became SciPy Special. There's a bunch of ufunks, they're called, kind of making more functions available in, in Python, universal functions. I wanted to make more of them, but the only way to make them prior to Numba was to compile code. I had to write C code and compile it, and it was just the accessibility was too small. So I always wanted the ability to have a vectorized decorator that would take a function that would work on scalars and compile it to machine code and then basically make a ufunk or something that could take any NumPy array and use that. So I wanted that for a long, long time. Finally with Numba we were able to do it very effectively and it's the easiest way of building a ufunk now, our universal function is just use Numba and there's a vectorized director. The key was recognizing that actually Python is just text, C++ is just text. If I can translate that text to an intermediate representation and use something like LLVM to do the code generation, Compiler would be easy. You don't have to do the parsing, you don't have to do the code generation. Those are the two hardest parts of a compiler. I just have to do the IR transformation. So the first version of Numba emerged in 2012, and it, was, and it worked. Now since then, it's gone through 38 releases, and so it's 0, 0 0.38, and it actually works really, really well. It's starting to become, people are starting to say, hey, we really should be relying on this and using it. And there are others who are using it, who are ahead of the curve, using it and getting great, getting incredible speed and development productivity. It's very easy to develop with, it's Python. You remove the JIT and you're debugging Python, right? Now if you remove the JIT, know that something like this, where you have four, four, uh, four loops, you're going to spend a lot of time in Python, but in 
when you JIT this, it works at the speed of C in Fortran. So it's just like you wrote C or Fortran code. And people are a little surprised by that until they realize, oh yeah, you're just compiling this by understanding the types. So a simple example, you take your uh, filtering array, non and compact basically, you add the number decorator, no Python equals true, just let means you don't, it removes the interpreter, and if it doesn't, it raises an error. error. The standard use case basically will just try to speed it up, and if it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything, and so it's just as slow as it used to be, right? But, and sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want to raise an error so you can see what happened. Did I get my type inference wrong, or was it able to tell some, I called some crazy class that I brought in? I want to, you want to understand that sometimes. But you add these things, and you, and you basically write something that's very NumPy-like, but now it's actually faster. And you can write code faster than NumPy, because you're not having to, NumPy has to do some, because it's pre-compiled, and it has to break everything down into pre-compiled loops, there's some overhead in doing that, so it's a lot faster. So a few things you may not know about Numba, 100% open source. Early on in Anaconda, we, we were selling something called Numba Pro, which is basically Numba to GPU. This is for a couple of years we were doing that, until, you know, uh, now I, I am very much a believer in complementary products. I don't believe in open core. Uh, I don't like the, I'm not going to write new, like, features are going to be, you know, paper features. You have soft, open source software, then you sell products that are complementary, but are different. Uh, so Numba is completely 100% open source, completely able to use it. Numba and Jupyter together is very rapid CUDA prototyping because you have a CUDA simulator. There's a CUDA Python and a CUDA simulator. So you can write Python code to simulate your CUDA code. Also, most people aren't aware of that. Uh, it can compile for the GPU and CPU at the same time. This is because we're using LLVM, which is the same technology NVIDIA uses to generate their, their code from their PTX code. And Numba makes array processing trivially easy. And then there, there are Numba developers, there's this new concept called a GPU data frame that's being worked on. So that's Numba. So hopefully if you haven't tried out Numba, try it out. It's really easy to start with and it will speed up your Python code tremendously. And if your favorite vendor, your favorite framework doesn't have Numba compatibility, get on them. Push them, punch them, tell them they've got to they gotta make use of it. And if you want help with that, they can call me at Quonsite, I'll help them. It's very easy. <laughs> uh, Dask. So Dask scales out. Dask is, and how many of you heard of Spark, actually? You have Spark user? Yeah, Spark is great for a Scala user. Great for a Scala user. If you're a Python user and you're using PySpark, try Dask. I'm not saying that it'll be the right solution for everything, but my guess is 80% of the things you're using PySpark for, you'll actually find Dask to be more Pythonic and easier to use, and as many of our customers found, eight to 10 times faster, because you're avoiding some of the, the copying of data between the two, the two uh, memories, JVM and Python memory. So Dask, its purpose was to scale, was to use NumPy and use Pandas, not recreate them, but use them. If you go to Sparkland, you had to build a new Spark data frame because they didn't have Pandas. In Dask, we didn't have to build a new data frame, we just used Pandas, and then distributed it by basically building a logical construct that allowed you to use these multiple data structures. So what Dask does, it has, at its core, a directed graph of, a directed ASIC graph of tasks that it's computing on. More granular level. Um, it's closer to actually a new project that's coming out of the, re the, the replacement to the AMP lab called Ray. The RISE lab has something called Ray. Ray is actually now starting to do things the way Dask was doing them, which gives you, it's much more Pythonic and much faster, therefore, for the kinds of machine learning uh, uh, problems you encounter. Uh, there's a task schedule that, that supports custom algorithms. Um, it uses NumPy, it uses de uh, Pandas, it doesn't try to rewrite them. Uh, here's an example of a scalable Pandas data frame. So you can have a logical data frame sitting maybe on a thousand nodes. Each of the nodes has one data frame on it, and then together, but you're interfacing with the client as a, a client, and it feels like you have this enormous data frame you're playing with. The API is very similar. Now it's building up a graph of tasks to compute. That is one thing to recognize, and we saw that earlier in the talk by Siam, where these frameworks build uh, delayed evaluation expression graphs. And there is a difference. So you basically, here you, you have to do that compute method at the very end. But other than that, it's very similar to how you, read, you do pandas. So I can read a parquet file, I can group by a particular name, compute the value, compute the mean. All that's basically building up a graph of tasks to compute across a cluster of machines. And then compute actually does the work. Uh, you do efficient time series, there's the pandas indexing that's similar. It's co-developed with the pandas community and so it it's, uh, maintains feature compatibility. And so as, as pandas emerges and goes to 2.0 Dask, easily emerges as well and goes to 2.0 and to use the, to leverage the underlying uh, improvements. The other thing Dask adds is a scalable NumPy array. So we started Anaconda with the goal of scaling NumPy and Pandas. Dask is the solution. Dask is the result of that. Very excited by it. Basically it gives you the ability to have an array that sits across a thousand machines. 
And you can, each, each machine maybe have a logical piece of the array that's a NumPy array, but you can do operations at a high level as if you're dealing with that large array. All in memory, it'll, it'll spill to this as necessary. It's resilient, you can add new workers, you can take workers away. The atmospheric science uses this tremendously. In fact, uh, there's an X-Array, is a labeled NumPy array that under the covers, it uses Dask. Uh, so you can use Dask array, you can also use X-Array, and if you start to do parallelism, parallelism and large-scale computing, you'll be using Dask. So very excited by Dask and the scale of NumPy arrays it, it brings. Dask scales up to 1,000 node complete com clusters, cloud computing, supercomputers, gigabyte bandwidth, an exciting space. Where you, if you have a lot of computers, Dask will help you use those computers efficiently. In fact, the origins of Dask, the origins of scaling, came from a problem I was seeing at, at one of the investment banks. Uh, credit, you know, counterparty exposure limit, credit limit. And in fact, what I saw is that is when I saw the problem they were solving could be written, you know, I had a solution to that problem basically in about <coughs> 20 lines of Python code if you had a NumPy array that scaled across machines. Right? So then, of course, you know, 20 lines of Python code plus three years of writing the task, uh, they have a solution to their problem. And what they had, it turned out, was a handwritten scheduler solution, basically. In order to solve that problem, they had a handwritten scheduler. And I would argue that our, the task scheduler is better than that. But you know, it, was, it was a lot of work. And so a lot of problems, a lot of organizations have a problem, and they basically put, in, they put a lot of effort and a lot of time into a half-baked scheduler solution to that problem. So something like DAS comes in and actually simplifies a lot of code, simplifies a lot of the use cases, a lot of problems. Uh, it also scales down, so you can actually experiment with it on your, on your laptop and use the, the eight cores we all have on our process on our laptops today. Okay, maybe you only have two or three, uh, like me. The other thing DAS brings is actually some pretty incredible, beautiful diagnostic dashboards. This is actually the advantage of being in a place like Anaconda, where we not only were, were investing and developing scalable solutions for PyData, but also investing in visualization stories like Bokeh and Hallviews, which now those, develop, those two developers got together, and then the DAS developer, it was so easy to build dashboards with Bokeh that he could build them. So he didn't have to become a visualization expert. He could just, with his knowledge, build an incredibly nice, useful dashboard to see what are your machines looking at? If you have a thousand machines and a, and a, and a process running, if it goes wrong, that's one of the hard things, is having visualization, interactive visualization, can help you see, oh yeah, something's happening here, why, are, why is this machine working, or these are, but this isn't. And so there's some really incredible kind of drill down responsive dashboards, powered by Bokeh, that come out of the box if you install Dask. So, for the last five minutes, I want to finally finish by talking about how do I actually apply these in my organization? Because there's some incredible tools now that are available, incredible tools. If you're not familiar with them, keep studying, and there's more that I haven't talked about. There's so many, so much out there. Uh, it can be a little daunting to figure out how to build new tools. But using them is a different story, and the daunting problem here is actually uh, the processes and the organization. It's actually not the tools. The tools are sort of the easy part. Uh, so here I have kind of a list, I think about using machine learning and AI. It does require a process, and the process changes, but it kind of has these characteristics. Data management, model management, right? And in between is this interactive tool. And the interactive tool is where people like to play, but you've got to have the data management process. You've got to figure out how I'm going to deal with the data and the data silos. In some cases, it's actually due to the people own their little data place. They like the fact they own that data place. And, you know, one, at Continental Airlines, one guy had to bribe somebody with chocolates every day just to get access to the database because that, they owned that, right? And it wasn't a simple way to get it. So you have to bring your data together. It doesn't mean necessarily a data lake. Usually it's actually bringing metadata together, bringing people together to talk about how do I get access to it. And then, and then there is permissioning. You know, make sure the authorizations are in place so that the right people can have access to the data they need. Use visualization tools. Uh, the best way to explore your data is to look at it. And looking at it when you have billions of data points means you have to think about how you look at it. So things like data shader and visualization matter. Uh, do some AI brainstorming. Unsupervised learning to uncover relationships in the presence of people with experience. I love unstructured, unsupervised learning to kind of explore a data set as long as somebody's nearby who actually knows the space we're looking at. To kind of help guide what are we learning. We see all these clusters, we see these things here. What does it mean? Uh, you can. You can the AI kind of brings that extra uh, brain to the table. You extract the right features, quote unquote right features, and then build and validate a model. That's usually the, the, the relatively straightforward part. Repeat that for many models. This is the AutoML. The fact that there's actually a ton of models supply, great, use them all. That's what Parallel Machine's for. Uh, Azure is happy to sell you a lot of machine uh, uh, units uh, in the cloud to do, repeat this for many, many models. And then communicate and publish those models. That's a whole process. And at the same time, you've got to manage that model. Usually with a process, it's not just a software, it's managing that, that process. 
So the data management process is much more in the data lake, brings people together, it's an optimization, is uh, detail. What's needed is to bring the information together by bridging the vocabularies and the thoughts of the different tribes in an organization. They all have different ways of thinking about their data and they have to come together to collaborate. That's the hard problem. And that's what you can do. You can use tools to get there. Notebooks can help there because at least they can talk the same language and see the same outputs. That can really help them rather than one person using one software and another person using another. Uh, notebooks, really, I think that's one of their primary value propositions is bringing all these different tribes together in an organization. So it's a virtual data and metadata lake that are more important necessarily than just having a cache, a cache lookup. Interactive tools. I'm a big fan of JupyterLab. What we're pushing on JupyterLab this year, JupyterLab is going to extend the notebook to provide even better and more extensible ways to bring people together with these interactive tools. Data visualizations everywhere. Uh, go look at Anaconda for tools like Bokeh and Holoviews. Uh, this is Bokeh for rapid, rapidly producing rapid prototyping of visualization apps. It's very easy with Bokeh Server to do this. Uh, data Shader lets you render billions of points quickly from uh, all the traffic in the airline traffic in Europe to uh, taxi drivers in, in, in the United States and in, in, uh, uh, New York. Uh, data Shader, I'm not going to go over that. Uh, talk, talk to me later if you want to learn more about these tools that can help. Uh, Holoviews, it's data driven visualization. That's what I love about Holoviews. When you, when you visualize, a data scientist doesn't want to spend their time writing plot this, change this axis label to green, plot this other data. They want to say, here's my data, now show it to me. Right? And Holoviews is that data centric visualization. To do that effectively, you typically have to add data and apply attributes to it. Take the data and then start, start um, making attributes, little uh, uh, intelligent labeling. And once you do that, then you can determine what visualization to apply. So that's, that's Holoviews and the theme around Holoviews. And it gives you the ability to rapidly produce visualization applications and dashboards by <coughs> applying that domain expertise to your data. So once you've done that, then at the very end, you've got to have a model management process. I'm not so interested in, in tools for this. I, I love tools for this because it'll bring people together and help them do that. But most of the time, it's actually talking to somebody about, okay, you have this model you did once, now how are you going to use it again? And it's going to go stale. It's going to go stale. It's going to take a week, a day, a month, a year. At some point, you've got to keep that. You've got to figure out whether the data's changed, whether you have to apply it again. How are you going to do that? That's the real question you have to answer and make sure people are aware that they have to answer before you just saddle them with a new um, solution they didn't realize they had to manage. So that model management process is definitely much more than just automatic stuff. There's no software solution that will do it. There's tools that will help, but you've got to take care of this and understand the time scale that you need to manage that model. So together, basically, with a lot of these tools and more that I haven't talked about, we can start to make this transition from the simple era of the AI that are just driving us around with bumps, with bumps and breaking down every day to kind of the future AI where it's really a seamless part of our existence and our life, making the world a better place. Thank you. AI. Let's go on with the questions. I really like the most popular one. What is the non-existing tool in data science that we miss the most? Oh man, honestly, tool data science is the most. Uh, well, for me, it's uh, it's the uh, uh, tool that lets me mix and match my, uh, my favorite frameworks, so I can use TensorFlow and CSDK and Chainer together. So that's for me what I, what I miss. Uh, other tools are kind of there. Thank you. Uh, what do you think? How quantum computing can change AI? And Oh, that's a good question. So I'm not personally a big believer that quantum computing is going to be much of a deal for us. <laughs> so I'm kind of maybe the counterproductive person. I see quantum computing as an, as an analog computer, and digital computers won years ago. So I think you'll find some small use cases of quantum computing over the coming years, but I'm not. I was actually at IBM talking to an IBM engineer, looked at their 50-bit quantum computer, and talked in depth about it. It's a very clever analog computer that'll... But getting to the point where it'll actually achieve some things like RSA and the ability to break down these cryptography problems, it's a, there's a lot of technology that has to take place between now and So it's not something I'm, I'm worried about or even think about much. I think it's mostly, a, mostly an interesting way to, to get you excited about something. So I, I love optics. I mean, if you look at the quantum computer, it's basically an NMR optic device. And I love all those technologies. I love NMR, I love MRI, I love optics. So it's fun, but I don't see it having practical applications for 50 years. Uh, being a coding person, what's your personal opinion on the potential and future of code-free visual data science and uh, machine learning? Code-free visual data science. This is basically like, um, that's a good question. Uh, I think, I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that question, though, honestly, because 
It'll kind of depend on the next, the, the rising generation, the one that I think should be using learning Python. Uh, so if you think code free means reading Python scripts, then yes, a lot of uh, there'll be hundred percent of people doing that. But if code free means you'll be dragging and dropping things, I think that'll always play a niche role because it's useful. It's, what, what happens is those techniques are very useful to get started with. And then invariably you want to go to something more powerful to make improvements. So I think they'll always be kind of help people get started and kind of an entry point. It's like the shallow end of the pool, and there'll be lots of shallow ends of the pool. But it doesn't mean deep ends will stop being built. I think there'll be a lot of it. Just be, it'll just bring more people in. What's the most common mistake that you have seen tech companies use when starting to integrate the more data-driven mindset in solving their problems? The most common mistake is to not be aware of the technologies available. Like to basically uh, go and just kind of knee-jerk react to something. Like usually it's like, oh, the press says this, I'm going to go use this tool and it'll solve all my problems. Instead of thinking about it and doing a broader perspective of what solutions, what, what, is, what is actually needed. So think about your business problem, and then be aware there's lots of technology solutions. Find a trusted person to help bring those to you, and then effectively what they use is going to be your, your guide. But, so just because you don't know about the tool your expert's bringing to you doesn't mean it's not the right one. But where to start? What would be your advice to this? Uh, to start, good question. I mean, uh, I would actually go in your local community and find smart people and, and, and consult with them. Honestly, I think you really do need to bring people in. You have a, a, a pro-expert company, right? You do that for people. I do the same thing for people. I think you have to go and find somebody who knows about these spaces uh, and bring them in. Go to a PyData meetup, go to a, a conference like this, just go talk to somebody and probably talk to like five people and then try to figure out what's right, what fits with your company. First company should realize that it's fine that they're not the smartest yes. guys everywhere. Yeah, yeah. actually the, the smartest folks, the best, the smartest technology actually is not your problem, typically. Like, the, if you're going to succeed, it's because you have low-hanging fruit, and then it kind of doesn't really matter which technology you use in the end. Uh, that's not entirely true if you get technical debt. I mean, so it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah, what do I say? I mean, yeah, come talk to somebody that's, that's done it a few times. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of smart people out there to, to lean on. Sure. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Thank you.